Over the years, I've played a bunch of different games in a bunch of different ways. From my very first experience playing through the original Crash Bandicoot on the PlayStation 1, all the way to throwing myself into the endless abyss of challenge and lore that is Hollow Knight. Throughout my time, there has been a consistent theme that resonated with me no matter which game I touched. How did I want to play? Starting out with a 3D platformer game designed around snappy movements and well-timed jumps was a strong way to begin my journey through the world of video games. It set me up with a strong skill set based around character movement, timing, momentum, pattern recognition, and so much more. But this is all mechanics. There is so much more to video games than just how you operate your character. What about lore? I remember the first time I ever played a video game on a computer. It was a Flash game called Adventure Quest. Well, actually, everybody in my friend group used to call it Battleion, which just happens to almost be the name of the starting town. So yeah, we couldn't exactly read at this point in our lives, especially when you consider that we thought the strongest weapon in the game was the Blade of Aoi. Oh god, what is wrong with me? Anyway, while there was a combat system in place, and a genuine, if a bit slow, sense of progression, what made me keep coming back was learning more and more about the characters and their backstories. When was I going to find the other Twillies hiding in the forest? What is the story behind the one and only Dragon Slayer in the game? Why can't I join his exclusive guild? There have been a few games that I've played where the lore was truly captivating. The first Assassin's Creed game and Dishonored come to mind when I think of this. But this is all just story. What more is there to video games than the characters and writing? What about competition? The first taste I got of a player versus player scene was none other than Team Fortress 2. God, this game was amazing. The skill ceiling, the community, the fucking hats. I was completely obsessed with this game and very quickly I gained an interest in attempting to get over 1000 kills on every strange weapon in my inventory, trying to master as much of every class and subclass as I could, going from stock loadouts to rocket jumping, backstabbing to trimping, supporting my teammates however I could to dancing in the middle of a battlefield just to watch the ensuing chaos. This game had it all, and the unpredictability of every round just made me keep coming back again and again. Though, I began to get a taste for something a little more dangerous. Something that would make me need to think faster, act quicker, play smarter. A real, competitive experience. Suddenly Overwatch was on the scene, and it had me positively hooked. Get it? Because I was a Roadhog main? Whatever. I tried to play this game much like I did in Team Fortress 2, with varying levels of success. There were far too many characters for me to consider maining them all, so I picked two from each category and tried to master them to the best of my ability. I wanted to be a true flex player, who wasn't limited by any specific skill sets and wouldn't be left defenseless should my team need me in a specific role. But there's been something lurking in the background of all of these games, however. Something that I found increasingly intriguing as I got older and the games I played began to show signs of becoming repetitive. Completionism. The first game I ever sat down and made the proper attempt to fully 100% was New Super Mario Bros. Wii. This game was a challenge to beat like this. I remember spending hours upon hours collecting star coins to get me closer and closer to unlocking every level in World 9. There was something extremely satisfying about having a clear goal in mind and knowing exactly what was required in order to achieve it. The length of time and difficulty were of no consequence here. The next game I did this with was Super Hexagon, then Borderlands 2, then Ori, then Hollow Knight. The list kept going. Once I'd finally collected everything in New Super Mario Bros., and in my case also had 99 lives, Mario would perform a little spin and take off his hat and a little victory chime would play. That was your reward. And honestly, coupled with the immense sense of self-satisfaction that you felt, it was more than enough. This felt different to just beating a game, winning a round, ranking up. This was something that derived entirely from my own drive. It's this drive that brings me to speedrunning. There are a few ways that games can be played. Dev intended, exploration, and challenges. The developer intended way demonstrates exactly what it says on the box. You load up the game and go from start to finish in the way that the developers advertised. For a typical campaign, you get your 30 hours of gameplay for most AAA games or around 15 hours for most indie games. The objective is just to reach the end and to reach the credits. But if we're being honest, this is not how most would experience a game. The most likely way for a game to be experienced is through exploration. This act of playing a game and exploring it is one that has no time limit and is often a true example of how players show individuality in their experience. 
There is, however, another nuance that players can adopt that can stray from the dev's intentions. Self-imposed challenges. Making a game more difficult outside of a game difficulty slider has been a common theme in video games for decades. One of the more prominent examples of this being used happened in 2010 for Pokemon Ruby. You've most likely heard of the Nuzlocke challenge, where players artificially increase the difficulty of a game by limiting how they can catch and use Pokemon. These challenges offer no greater reward than just beating the game normally, but the satisfaction given to the player for beating a harder difficulty is often enough to make them come back for more. Increasing difficulty within video games comes in many forms. One of the most intriguing ways is to try and beat the game as fast as possible. On the surface, this challenge can easily appear to just be a matter of following the developer intended route. There is, however, one more thing you have yet to include. The community. Combining the efforts of many different individuals to achieve a common goal of cracking a game wide open and beating it faster than ever expected has become an obsession on the internet. To be able to see gamers perform at the absolute highest level of efficiency under some of the most stressful conditions, with the help of friends, family, and the gaming community, completely destroy a game. There is something different about booting up a game with the specific objective in mind to try and beat the game fast. It sets you up mentally to see everything in the game as a form of obstacle. No matter how difficult or simple a task, they are all obstructions that lie between you and the finish line but it also allows you to see achievements and improvements on a very quantifiable scale. Beating a game as an achievement looks like a yes or no tick box. You have two options. Did you beat the game or not? Defeating a boss or clearing a section also has the same yes, no outcome. And these are only really good for one success and then they become void. But when you ask, how long did it take you to beat the game? How fast did you clear this section? Did you beat the boss in under a minute? You didn't even take damage? Suddenly you can take these simple questions and visualize what kind of progress you're making. Beating the game in 1.5 hours, to then do it in one, then under one hour, defeating this boss first in five minutes, then faster in four minutes, four minutes but taking no damage, sub three? You can see yourself constantly improving. Most like in any challenge, you only need a goal in order to get started. The difficult part is getting past the failure. You will find times where sometimes days, maybe even weeks go by without seeing any major improvements to your statistics. Top speedrunners spend hours upon hours just trying to scrape mere seconds off their previous best times. And for what? You remember how you can see yourself improving? Well, others can do that too. Speedrunning is not only about beating your own best times, but also competing against the times of others. The beauty of it is how beating someone else's time doesn't feel like you're having fun at the detriment of another, but almost like you're setting them with a new challenge, a new time to beat. This competitiveness drives camaraderie, and I've always been so blown away with how open and helpful the speedrunning communities are. No matter how you choose to play a game, there will always be more to uncover and more depth to explore. Whether you choose to play a game casually and take your time drinking in the scenery, or aim to beat it without ever taking damage. Perhaps you aim to do everything the game has to offer, or perhaps you just want to see how deep the rabbit hole can take you. Even the simplest of games will have something deeper to offer, if you're willing to dig for it.